got a report that uh, Dave Wiley, who used to be a past president of the society, has uh, passed away. Um, and uh, most people wouldn't know Dave because he goes back to the very early parts of the society. And in fact, that's the only information I have is that he's actually passed away. And uh, I did a bit of a search to see if I could find a picture of him. And that, uh, this is uh, Dave Wiley here. That's uh, Don Driver, who was the original president of the society. And anyone like to guess who that is? That's Bruce Triaskis in the very uh, young form of the World War II. And the person who took the photo is uh, uh, Alden still standing in front of me. Um, so I thought first of all we'd uh, stand and just give uh, Dave a, a minute of silence. Oh, 
finding conventions. Uh, from the, now the, the next thing is that we've got two uh, motions that we'll put up at the school here. Um, of the last general meeting in November, it was uh, announced that we intended to put to the members that uh, we would ask to see if the name of the train. Uh, the suggestion box is if anyone might, would like to ask a question, um, uh, one of the things we find is some people sometimes don't ask the, the silly questions and say we've asked them. Um, the good thing about the suggestion box is you can throw in all sorts of questions. Please, anyway. Um, and uh, also any other suggestions as to how you would like to see the um, society change or do things differently. Uh, and uh, what was it again? Oh, social factors, that's right. The, the other thing is uh, Sally's looking for ideas for social uh, functions and social activities. If you'd like to see any particular type of social function, could you write that in for her, please? Uh, back to the, uh, the name change and the fee changes. Um, in last November we, we said that we'd like to put it to the members that the society changed its name uh, from the Astronomical Society of Frankston to the um, Astronomical Society of the Mornington Peninsula or the other way around? The Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. Um, uh, this has been something that's been brewing for a, a while. And uh, we've got to the point where we'd like the, the numbers to, to both of them. Uh, those people who um, had their Scorpio know that the, the motion was just that, that uh, the committee proposing that the members change the name of the society uh, to the Mormon Peninsula Astronomical Society. Is anybody, before we make a vote on it, does anyone like on the comments or ask any questions? <coughs> Well, we'll put the vote. The, the, those uh, members that are in favour of changing the name to the Mormons of the Peninsula Astronomical Society raise their hands. Those against? Okay. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the other um, uh, proposal was that we change the uh, fees of the society. Um, uh, currently our fees are uh, $35 for a normal member and they're structured around that with other types of members and uh, we're proposing to increase that to a base $50 um, which I think brings us in line with the ASV. The, um, the uh, last time that we changed our subscriptions, apart from the GST which was pretty well government imposed change uh, goes right back into the uh, 80s, I think. Yeah, it goes, it goes back quite a way. Um, we've got to the point where uh, the running costs of the society, but it's always been a, a policy that we would like the running costs of the society to be covered by subscriptions and that we don't have to actually go out and uh, earn money to keep the society going. And we've got to the point where the, the society cannot cover its running costs on subscriptions alone. And we have to go out and actually go to schools and run public nights and things to keep the society running. And we'd like to correct that by actually increasing the, the subscription. Do you like to say anything, Marty? Thanks. Does anybody like to? Oh, sorry. Would you like to talk about what the rates are? Oh, yeah, I'm not really sorry, sorry. Oh, the, 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 um, the newsletter that went out. Yeah, I'm sure everyone got the newsletter. As Peter said, the base rate for full time member will be from thirty five to fifty dollars. Um, family um, proposed to go from forty five to sixty five. Um, uh, the mission from thirty to forty five. So it's 
Full membership $50, family membership $65, pensioner membership $45, family pensioner $60. Uh, the newsletter on its own uh, was $22, students $35, and if any organisations want to join us, uh, $70. But we're still hopeful. Has anybody asked any questions on that? When will it become effective because I'm just about to check out? Start writing. Same as a few people. It will be effective from tonight. If, if people agree with it, then that's probably effective. But someone could make a motion for it to be backdated. Does the treasurer have to do it? Is it, is it feasible to do it in two stages? It's a large increase at once. I know we haven't had one for a long time. Is it feasible to do it in, in two bits? Yeah, I mean, we can do it any way. That it's, it's entirely up to members. Well, we can do it any way you like. The, the, the proposal to go to 50 is, uh, there's no science behind it. What we've done is said, well, we'd like to be able to cover the cost of society. And it works out roughly at about that. Um, so the, the, the number was just thrown up that way. Uh, if the members want to do it some other way, I've no objection to it at all. So basically the $50 um, will cover the running costs as they are, or will only just cover the running costs as they are, um, as they were actually for the last two years. Because so, we've had different various fees coming like um, two years ago, we weren't really, I don't think we were paying for the electricity here to start with. Yeah. Um, we weren't getting the, the lawn and the guys um, professionally made with the, the proper sit on mail. So there's been, um, as well as um, insurance as well, public liability insurance has also increased. So over that period of two years, just for well, the recent two years, there's also been quite a number of large increases in fees that society has, has taken on. So um, we came to the conclusion that $50 just cover everything that we're paying for um, at the moment. Um, subscription we pay for. So that's why we went to the $50. It does seem sort of a large amount, but we sort of thought it was necessary to go put that base $50 down to do that. Um, can I just make a point that just from two simple modes of thinking, we haven't had an increase for at least eight years. Taking inflation at a rock bottom 2.6%, that's about 16% due, which roughly goes, going back to the 35% single charge, equates to a rise, just on basic inflation, of $11, which makes it 46, which is $4 short of the 50 that's coming. Another argument is that Marty showed last November meeting that our Income was approximately $600 more than expenses, so it's tightening. What I've heard tonight, everyone accepts that subscriptions meet, do meet the costs, but from my observations, we had a tight out year last year with somewhat declining school nights and the briars thing running down a little bit. Um, people are tightening up. So, from my point of view, Listening to the argument that one or, and possibly two people are saying that can, can the fee be staggered in payment, the society could be caught out by that. Um, maybe it needs to be done on a personal basis, but I, I, I'm basically all for it on a society basis. It, it has to be. Just.
15, 20 dollars. Then you have the other group, which are the larger societies that are trying to provide um, services to the members in terms of uh, observing facilities and, and social facilities and things like that. And they fall into, the, into a higher category. And um, uh, so you've got uh, ASV, New South Wales, South Australia, people like that. And they're all up in the 45, 50 range. So, and, and we're making that transition in the West. We're um, starting to provide facilities like the RISE, which are a fixed cost that we have to cover. And so we, we, we feel that we need to be able to match that. If 20 members um, on, say, a, a single basis of $50, <coughs> stagger their payment twice, we lose, as a society, about $60 on that basis. And if things go tight in one year, we could get caught out on things like that. It's possible. So just my personal view is... I think if individuals want to stay in the payment, then it's really a treasure for the society. Yeah. Not a lot of like that. It's yeah. thing. It will be all over the place. <laughs> Has anybody else got any? Oh, sorry. I'll stand up and face you. <coughs> when we've heard all the technical arguments, and I like to reduce uh, things down to really basic terms, uh, we're talking about a $15 a year increase. And if you equate that to, say, those of you who are smokers, it's probably about one and a half packets of cigarettes over a year. Or if you go to Red Rooster, it's one and a half Red Rooster chooks over a whole year. So it's really not a huge big deal. And the extra $15 per head that the society is going to get, no one's going to run off with it. No one's going to do anything untoward with it. It's going to be put into the coffers and used to give uh, all the things we can give back to you lot. So I really don't think there's big hassle about it. Yeah, Thanks, Jim. Okay, we'll, we'll put that in the, um, the uh, fees of the society change to those proposed by the, the um, treasurer. Second. All those in favor? I'll second. You'll second? Oh, we don't need a second. Yes. Um, all those in favor of changing the fees? All those against? Is it unanimous? Good. Unanimous to me. Okay, I okay, guess right. Yeah. The name change wasn't unanimous. I know. Well, I'm, I'm staying with my place. No, you didn't put your hand up. I saw you. You have to stand up. The fee thing. Ah, more writing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, end of January is the deadline for going, or rather applying to go to the National Australian Convention of, um, of Amateur Astronomers, the NASA, in Tasmania. Um, uh, I've got I've got uh, I've got uh, an application form here on the one side. I've got fifteen I got one off the off their website and the moment I tried to copy it in uh, the site crashed, so I got one. Um, the um, the NASA is something that's been going for quite a few years. This is NASA twenty one. And it's a, it's a convention where people from all around Australia, all the various societies around Australia, um, can come together to discuss who's doing what and look at some of the, the uh, researches that are being done by the uh, more active uh, uh, amateurs. And uh, a, lot of these, a lot of the very active amateurs are, are actually working quite close to the professional um, observatory. And this is a, a good opportunity to, to get involved with that. Uh, I've been going for for donkey years, and, and uh, now Peter Norman's been going for years, and I found them to be extremely good. Um, the Frankston Society has nominated to take on the NASA after that, and so um, if we carry on with that, we want to make sure that this one uh, is successful. So anyone that's interested in that, I've got some paperwork out for it. Uh, Peter says there's some, there's some um, uh, forms at the front. <laughs> So what we're going to do?
proposed the AGM Thank <laughs> you. 
welcome to uh, to the new year. And uh, just going to give a couple of small talks on uh, TLD, Cambrite Scape Day. But before I do, life has been found on Mars. what they can do, 
There's a lot of different um, observing projects that you can do. And one of my aims this year with TLDs is trying to get some people into some observing projects, whether that be variable stars or double stars or deep sky blocks, messy out, whatever. Um, we're going to talk about that and uh, some of the information that's about to uh, get you going with that. And we'll go into the night, obviously. And weather forecasts so far for this Sunday are quite good, but anything could change in this morning. There is a fairly deep low uh, around Queensland and New South Wales, and if that, there is some quite heavy thunderstorms over in um, eastern Victoria at the moment, so who knows what's going to happen that Sunday. I don't guarantee I can get your telescope to looking at some of these ones, though. But Hubble's out there, so I won't show too much. We'll have a, have a bit more of that next. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> go away. Okay, we'll go on to uh, Cambrian Scope Day, which is coming up on the 27th, advertised on the 20th, but it is going to be the 27th. That's a nice bright screen. This is me playing with PowerPoint, so I'm just learning how to use all this sort of stuff. Um, Cambrian Scope Day or KBSD, which is nice and easy to say, is a day we have a chance for everyone, and it's sort of not, not so much like a teaching day as the TLDs. This day is for people to show off their telescopes. So if you've built one, brought a 14 inch Macassar grain, bought a 20 inch witchy Crichton, whatever you've got, how else we can try. <laughs> everyone comes down and bring their telescopes and shows them off. And hopefully we'll get a few members to give a bit of a talk on uh, how they built their telescope, how what you know how the telescope works, all that sort of thing. Um, it's all about telescopes, and it's all about your telescope, um, and it's all about my telescope and your friend's telescope and all that. So we all get together and uh, have a really good day. We've had one one of these so far, and that was a couple of years ago. And it was earlier called Scope Day, and this was our, our first Scope Day, and it rained most of the day. It rained all day. <laughs> it did. And, um, but we sat there, I think from midday, into the dark, and, um, well, I mean, everyone had got their grief, there was lots of talks, all that sort of thing, and I think we did eventually set a telescope up, Marty, I think, we did, yeah. didn't we? We did. And, um, yeah, we were, actually, I think we were looking at Mars, Mars was quite, quite small back then. This is around March, Sometimes, so much can sometimes obviously rain. And you know, scope days are um, you know a lot of fun. <coughs> KBSD came about because um, a while ago, a friend of ours, a great friend of ours, came by, <coughs> passed away, and we have a running scope day. And we thought, you know, his love for telescopes and observing um, was really you know passionate. So we thought we would name. <coughs> Um, scope day after him. He loved building his telescopes and he made a couple. He made the, an 18 inch and he made an 8 inch and um, many other things and he was a fairly passionate observer. And for those who don't know Ken, that's him now on your, on your right. And uh, he's showing off his pair of binoculars and that binocular stand that he made. And that stand actually got into uh, Sky and Space magazine. I think it may have been called Southern Astronomy many years ago. And uh, Ken's family kindly donated that tripod and those binoculars, so they're up the rise for anyone to use. And if you've never looked through those <coughs> pair of binoculars before, come along and have a look because they're uh, they're amazing. Here we are. MSD is on 27th this year, starting at noon, going through the night. It's a BYR lunch, and I think I got the approval from the committee. I'm <laughs> pretty sure we did. Uh, we will supply dinner and. I need people to book with me before the 27th and uh, tell me what you would like and we will try and organise something. We're not going to get Scotchville at stakes for the whole night. <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll try and cater something for you. And then we send coffee on hand. And that is not a scope day. That is actually a picture of a Christmas barbecue. As you can tell by the figure. ABSD is all about people and their telescopes. This is me with a couple. Nice little case. So let's telescope, and then we all arrive again, um, ready to observe on one of our days. So come along to KBSD, it's a, it will be a great day, we'll have a raffle, and we'll have a very special prize by raffle. I'm not saying it's going to be a telescope, but we will have a very special prize if I can organise it. 
and um, hopefully we'll get some uh, couple little talks with you and uh, really have a good day. And we will have a prize for someone who comes along and puts on the best display. All right, so that will be well worth it as well. I'm not sure what I'm donating yet. Okay, <coughs> a few more minutes. Yeah, okay, go for it. Okay, um, I recently bought this laptop last year, and I'm not that great with computers, but I'm getting to know it. And I have an Alex 200, which I bought just recently. And some few people have asked me about controlling telescopes with my planetarium program, which I've got. This is Cast UCL, which is free on the web. I couldn't afford some of the programs when I rang up a few shops and said, "How much are these?" And they said, "200, 400 dollars." Okay. <laughs> We're not buying that. So I've downloaded this and it's a quite a good program. And give me a few minutes, I'll give you a little idea how it's going. It's quite good, it shows you does many different things, not sky. And it's running at uh, it's just on 2038, you can see what right at the top corner at the moment. So that's why the sky is nice and bright. So we'll run that. A little bit darker, we'll get to 22, <coughs> 2200, and we'll be 10 o'clock at night. We'll be getting back out there. Ah, uh, man, my buttons. Sorry about that. What's the halo stars? Does that mean to simulate the fog on your life? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and for all those who don't know uh, constellations, there's the shapes. Looking to the south.
bit of information about them. Alright? And again, all for free. And if you look carefully, the moon's on uh, Saturn go around very slowly. If you look carefully, you will see them. See it moving? Can you say you want to find where that particular moon is and show you which dot it is? Then I'm not sure. Does <laughs> the software show you what aperture you pick those moons up? Um, well, if you go onto the moon, I'd say this one. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's 12.6 mag. Mm -hmm. So you can work out from there if you can see that or not. What's the name of the program we going back? Count Caps 2 CL. Yeah. And I like this. I wanted to show this um, when our friend last year was here, Jupiter. Okay, there's Jupiter. And we'll just run the animation again. I'm a bit slow. Speed it up. <coughs> interesting here is that the program can tell you when the great red spot comes around. <coughs> Which it will in a minute, but it's heading towards six in the morning, so we're not going to see it that night. <coughs> you can have a look in the corner there. Alright, so it's quite daylight at the moment. <laughs> the reason the screen's not daylight is because it's a very small um, part of it, uh, part of the sky. But you can see the red spot there, and again it does the same thing with the moons, which work your over, etc. etc. So, when I like, what I like about it, you can see that the moon's rotating, then one came in front before, and one's going behind. Does it happen going into eclipse? No. I won't show you that. Did you get an idea what it does there? <coughs> Not bad for free. Not bad for free, is it? No. And um, stop that. And it should be back up. We go back to there. No, we're below the horizon, that's right, because Jupiter set. Let me just set your time again. Shade where NGC 104 is, and you can just click on the object. You've got to be careful you don't click on the start, it's quite easy to do that. And um, what is it? <coughs> and you can click on stars. You can see. Peter, am I running out of time? And um, full of catalogues as well. Okay. We want to have a look at the um, double stars. You click on this. I don't put them all on there because if I click on everything and it's all on the, all on the screen, you will see that it fills it up too much. You can see all the double stars that came up. All, the little, all these are double stars. Zooming on the chart. Or will it come up as a double? 
Well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay, Jim and I. Okay, the constellation Jim and I. Yeah. Go to, um, I'm not going to go to Go to cash that. Alpha, Jim and I. If you want to. That's fine. quite good too because what I like is that it gives you a <coughs> uh, little altercations that happen as the moon moves. <coughs> so you can 
see I can't be bothered doing much except for playing with this all right. <laughs> Not really. Um, there's a Luna Grays on the 29th of uh, this month. Is that? With a magnitude 6 there. Uh, okay. You know what time? Uh, I can't remember. It'll be <coughs> early evening around 8pm, 9pm. Uh, but uh, visible on the page change This uh, software is uh, set up for monitoring, so mm. there you go. Mm. Can I get in motion? Mm. Um, we probably could. You can see it. Mm -hmm. Right, they take your glasses off here. We'll reverse it up a bit. Off of this, running a bit more. <coughs> there we go. And it's going to disappear. All right, there you go. That's um, there's a software that a few people ask what I use. Free on the internet. There you go. Not too bad for nothing, is it? All right. So remember TLD this Sunday. KBSD, uh, 27th of March, Give me, um, please let me know if you're coming to that and if you want dinner. And I hope to see you all there Sunday and we can have a look at Jupiter and Saturn for real. Thank you.
I'll, I'll, I'll send that date to you to see if there's something. What, what I like with that program is you can do any dates. Yeah. And I like just the satin at the moment is in the northern sky, which is really bad. <laughs> we like it in the south. So I like to change all the years on the software. Fortunately, we've got to wait till uh, past 2010, 2012 for satin to be overhead again. But when satin is overhead, the views are much better than they are when it's lower than north. So I'm, at least I can see it on the computer for now. <laughs> The, the amazing thing about all that is how we accept the, the computing part that's there. I'm, I'm, I'm just reading a book, of course, on, on how um, the orbits of planets were um, determined uh, prior to uh, Gauss developing the uh, three observational method. Um, and uh, it's done with effectively trigonometry. And uh, so the, the people in the sort of 15, 1800s, 1600s, if they wanted to try and work out uh, uh, movements of planets, had to literally draw and calculate up triangle after triangle after triangle. How they did it to be on the They obviously had a lot of time. I, I, I think they just had thousands of slaves at the back of the triangles. Very interesting. Um, the uh, Ubi's night, well, I didn't mention that. Was anyone?
Are you, are you okay or is it? I'm going in for about 10, 15 minutes. Can I turn the lights out on this one? Okay. I'm just, just. Um, just uh, something that Carl uh, uh, brought up. Carl's got a four and a half inch reflector that he's looking to sell. Um, with uh, it's four and a half inch, about four years old, tripod, three eyepieces. Uh, he bought it uh, at just over a thousand dollars, started before the five was looking to sell it for seven hundred. Uh, it's only been used a couple of times. So anyone that's interested in a four and a half inch reflector. Um, the, the other thing, while uh, Mark is coming out, um, we'd like to start doing a, uh, a simple survey on the general meetings so that uh, at each general meeting we'll get people to just fill out a quick form, which hopefully is just a ticker across in the right box, We're trying to get some information on how people enjoy the general meeting, whether they really enjoy it or they think it's uh, um, and uh, what, they, what they like about the general meeting, things they don't like, and any suggestions. So um, we'll give those to John, uh, ask people to just put a, a tick in the appropriate box. I'm going to try and do this on each, each meeting so we can get some statistics on how people are, uh, are enjoying the meeting or not. Ready? Yeah. I'll just wait for you to come back. Um, uh, I should have mentioned that uh, there is a video going on in the second room, if anyone wants to see it. Uh, called the day of the uh, earth will really die. Anyone wants to go and have a look at that? Oh, Mars attack. Mars attack. Mars attack. Mars attack. Mars attack. Mars
itself is trapped inside the lander and can't deploy its solar panels. If the solar panels don't deploy it, we don't have any power to charge our batteries, which is our only source of power on the surface. So if any one of these doesn't happen, it's a bad day on Mars.
there was a huge temperature difference from the inside and the outside of the heat shield. The vehicle on the outside is getting thousands of degrees centigrade, while the inside may get up to a barely room temperature. We go through what's called the heat and deceleration pulses as it slows down through the supersonic speeds and approaches Mach 2, we open the parachute. We're going down about a thousand miles an hour.
what we're seeing now is basically a continuation after landing um, and what's happened in the last probably week and a half now is that once the, um, the rover stopped bouncing and, and settled, the, um, the balloons went down, um, the, the lander opened up and then the um, actual rover itself um, started unfolding. The first thing it had to do was unfold the solar power um, panels, otherwise it wouldn't power, um, keep power so it could then continue on to do other necessary things like um, its wheels and so on and so forth. So what it's doing here now is um, unfolding its solar panels. But they couldn't get down its original way. <coughs> they didn't get down its original way. I'm not sure so that. They got stuck, so they had to go with the plan. On that. Okay. Plan B. Plan B, yeah. One of the bags um, didn't have fuel properly, so they got stuck. So oh, really? Yeah, they had to go with the plan. Sure. Well, that's exactly what I said in the previous meeting that anything like that could happen, you know, when the bags might not unfold and so on. Um, the first photos that the rover took were when it was in this position here, that it just unfolded. The, um, the solar panels have opened up, it's um, panoramic um, camera opened up and it took a complete panoramic view of where it was sitting at the time. <coughs> and then the next day it actually started completely unfolding as you can see. It's, it's got six wheels and um, they're all folded up in, in that triangular package. Um, it just continued to unfold itself like a, an origami type of thing. <coughs> The first thing it had to do is find the sun. Yes. Once it found the sun, it's got to find the earth. I did have a, um, a shape of all the different parts that were going on here, but of course I left it at home in front of the computer. So. <laughs> Transmission delay to Mars. What was it? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, is it? Three minutes. Three minutes. I was surprised it was that quick. Because it's so close. I'm not sure exactly how far it has moved from the lander at the moment. Um, I know it's um, got really close to a couple of rocks or a large rock, which was called that was after an American Indian name for a large mountain. Um, it's taken some samples of that rock um, yesterday. It's taken um, some really good photos of some soil today. Um, but what uh, apparently what it's supposed to do to this rock yesterday. So it has a little drill on in this um, device here, which um, can polish off the surface of the rock. <laughs> Website. 
Richard Pollard put two really good websites on Facebook. It's the other way. So. Okay, I'll probably run them. There's about three or four that actually lead to the site that has all these animations on it.
And I thought it'd be an interesting look at why this particular planet is so hard. Well, as they said in that little presentation that Marty did, the objective is to get the relative speed of the spacecraft down to survivable level. It's, it's needs to get down to a few meters per second. Um, but it's coming in at, at kilometers per hour, at, 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 at kilometers per second. Um, and we need to be able to wash off that energy. And the methods that they use uh, depend on, one, which particular planet you're trying to land on, and that, that really, um, the, the important parameters there are the mass of the planet and the atmosphere that you're trying to get through. Um, obviously, the mass of the spacecraft is an important factor, and how fast the spacecraft is going. If we look at the mass of the planet, obviously the mass determines the force of gravity that's being, that's being um, uh, exerted. And the gravity <coughs> really determines the approach speed. There's not a lot you can do in celestial mechanics to manipulate the orbit or anything to reduce the speed of the spacecraft. It's fundamentally going to come in at, uh, at the scale of velocity. Um, the gravity also determines how much atmosphere and how deep the atmosphere is. So if you're on a if you're on a, um, uh, a a large planet, you get a nice deep atmosphere, and because of the gravity, the atmosphere is denser at the bottom than it is at the top. If you go to a less um, massive planet, then the atmosphere is much shallower, and, uh, and you don't get as big a breaking area, if you like. And of course, that's the problem with Mars. Um, and the, the gravity also determines the type of atmosphere that you're going to deal with. So that if you look at Mercury, the moon, well, there's no atmosphere. So trying to come in with an ablation shield is a bit pointless there. Um, the Earth, we've got a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere because we've got life there. Mars is fundamental carbon dioxide. Jupiter, um, we've got a variety of organic uh, compounds. Now, that's important because when you come to bring the spacecraft in, the, that ablation period where it's to the, the, the re-entry period, um, the, the efficiency of that is determined by the composition of the atmosphere. If you look at the um, spacecraft, the spacecraft, the energy that that spacecraft has got is determined by its mass and it's determined by the speed. Uh, notice it's speed by the speed, so if we double the mass we get twice as much energy, but if we double the speed we get four times as much energy. So the thing we want to do is we want to reduce the speed. Now, unfortunately, um, there's not a lot you can do with the mass. You're obviously going to minimise it because you want to minimise it for launching purposes. Um, but there is a certain amount of equipment and things that have got to go on there. And um, uh, you, can, you can fiddle it. For instance, when we had the, the Pathfinder uh, spacecraft go to Mars, and you had that little surjoin uh, uh, device driving around, that was a purpose-built spacecraft purely to prove that that um, bag landing method would work. And so they had a very, very light spacecraft. It was only 180 kilograms. Um, this thing is 370 odd kilograms. So um, they, they sort of cheated on that, on that surge oil. Um, now, as I said, it's not a lot you can do with the approach speed because it's determined by the, by the planet. As a result, the kinetic energy of the spacecraft has got to be dissipated in the landing phase. Um, uh, hence the sort of thing that Martin was just showing you. Now, what sort of methods have we got of slowing up spacecraft? Well, we can just put a rocket on and slow it down directly. Um, and uh, I was trying to get a photo of a, of a lamb sitting on the moon. Do you think I could find one on the moon? Everywhere you go, it's Mars at present. Um, and this is a model of them. But the thing about it is that, that this was effectively just a rocket uh, with a couple of, um, of uh, 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 suspensions, you know, sort of uh, uh, shock absorbers. Uh, the, the other thing we could do is we could put a parachute on. And if you've got a big enough parachute and the atmosphere is dense enough, then that's all you need. And on Earth, that's fundamentally uh, all you need. On Venus, that's all you need. Um, you can put some explosives on. Now, one of the things that they did on the Pathfinder, which they didn't advertise, it sort of didn't come out in the, in the, in the uh, media,
but they actually had an explosive under the thing. So whereas on the on the uh, craft that's on Mars at present, they uh, they had rockets, so they had the parachute and then the rockets. On the um, Pathfinder, they actually had a plate about that sort of diameter, a little curved plate, and an explosive up inside it. And as it came down to the to the um, surface, they blew the explosive and it went bang up in the air, momentarily stopped, balloons opened up and it fell. And um, so they they didn't quite need the rockets, but they did need to get a, a bit of an explosive to blow it into the air. And this, I, I, I think I'll explain later, is probably what happened to the Beagle spacecraft that never made it. And you can put shock absorbers on, which is the sort of thing we see in, um, I'll show you some shock absorbers. So we see the, the balls, the shock absorber. There's one of the Venera spacecraft with a nice big shock absorber on it. Coming down in Venus, uh, all you needed was a parachute. They didn't actually need the shock absorbers, but they, they thought they'd better put something on to stabilize it. And so they just put a, 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 a effectively a, a rubber tire on the bottom of it. Um, but uh, in that case, they didn't actually need uh, retro rockets or anything. The thing just came down on the parachute. Um, and then there's the ablation um, method. Now, what's happened here is that the, the air is, or the atmosphere is being compressed up in front of the um, craft, and that compression is heating the, the atmosphere up to very high temperatures, 1300, 1400 degrees. And the energy is not caused by the compression. The energy that's dissipated is dissipated because of chemical reactions that the atmosphere um, goes through at those temperatures and different atmospheres will, will um, drive different reactions. The shape of the spacecraft has to be designed to the particular, particular planetary atmosphere that you're going in. So if you looked at the craft that went into Jupiter, <coughs> it's a totally different shape to the craft that went into Venus. And that's because they're trying to trigger different chemical reactions. Um, that only works provided the craft is going fast enough that it can drive those chemical reactions. And of course, any combination of the above, which is generally what happens. So what methods are we used? Well, I'm going to the moon, and I guess in the Mercury in the future, there's the, the, the LEM method, the rocket and, the, and a bit of an absorber. And that, that's okay, but it's... it's uh, you end up with a very heavy uh, craft. Um, landing on asteroids, we have landed on one. I'm trying to find a, what was the name of the asteroid? The Eros. Was it? Mm -hmm. um, on that one, we, I, I put down the shock absorber. We just went up and nudged it with the spacecraft and it stuck. But uh, the mass there is low enough that if you get the speed right, uh, you can just sort of go up and attach. Um, for Venus, as it showed there, they had an ablation shield and they had a parachute with a bit of a shock absorber. That was the Venera spacecraft. On Earth, uh, we've got uh, a couple of methods. The, the Americans uh, on the Apollo used an ablation uh, method, then a parachute, and then a shock absorber. The shock absorber was the Pacific Ocean. Um, the Russians uh, had a combination of ablation, parachute, and explosive, or uh, a rocket, and there was an argument about whether they actually had a rocket or not, because the, the blast was so abrupt it was effectively an explosive. And it was interesting that the, the um, Americans, when they were putting their um, uh, uh, surge on project, the Pathfinder project together, were having hell zone trouble trying to get bad technology that would stay together. What they were finding in their simulators was that they were ripping the bags. And they, they, they had this big vacuum chamber and they could blow the bags up and drop the spacecraft in the vacuum chamber onto what they thought marsh, the worst case Martian surface would be and every time it kept ripping the bags. And uh, I gather um, uh, after some discussion with the Russians, the Russians said, oh, we had that same problem. Um, and we put an explosive <coughs> under it and that solved the problem. And the Americans said, well, that's good enough for us. And so they ended up putting this explosive in which is why it didn't appear in the literature, because it got thrown in at the last minute. Um, and uh, so the Russians, when they bring back their soil craft, uh, do that, uh, that approach. And I guess the other approach is the, um, 
is the uh, shuttle method provided it stays together. Um, now, on Mars, we have a, a bit of a problem because the atmosphere on Mars is so thin um, and, and the mass of the planet is so low that there isn't just one short sequence. So on Mars, we have to do the whole lot. So they have to have an ablation method and a parachute and an explosive and a, a shot. <coughs> and it's just a lot of things to go wrong. And, and that's the secret of, of why Mars is so hard to land on, because there isn't just one way of getting down there. The, um, the uh, uh, explosive shock absorber was the, was the uh, pathfinder, and the uh, parachute shock absorber with the, with the, uh, the rocket is the, is the one that you've got to, um, uh, now. On um, Jupiter, of course, you never actually hit the surface, so that was just an ablation parachute. So there's different combinations. Now the thing about if you're going to uh, looking at Earth, Earth the, the, the method of landing, sorry this is my simulation of the uh, on Earth you have this um, ablation period where you're coming into the top of the atmosphere and burning up, slowing down, then the thing effectively comes down vertically on a parachute and then whatever method you've got of shock absorbing um, goes on. And uh, There. On Mars, the atmosphere is much, much um, um, thinner. And what that means is to wash, the, wash that energy off, you need to be able to go a lot longer. On the, on, on, uh, the, the higher mass planet, you can cut into the atmosphere faster. If you try to cut into the atmosphere of Mars, you hit the surface. So you, so you have to take a very shallow approach angle and that puts a lot of pressure on the um, navigation accuracy. Um, the other thing that, uh, that you get is a much faster dropping speed. On, on Venus they were dropping through the atmosphere at about two to three meters per second. On Mars they're dropping at about 300 meters per second. So they're, they're going much much faster and as a result they need to absorb downside more energy at the, at the end. So their technology has to be that much better. Now I think what happened with the Beagle, in my opinion, the Beagle didn't have this um, rocket or, or explosive phase. They decided that what they could do is that they could come down on much stronger bags. Now as you go for stronger bags, your weight goes up. So they decided they could tolerate a heavier um, spacecraft with much, much stronger bags and take a long time slowing the craft down and use the heavier bags to give them some survival at the bottom. Um, the Americans decided to go for the rockets, so that was a much safer approach. And I suspect that what happened was that the Beagle was dropping at 300 meters per second and the bags just went up to it. And so we now have a Beagle at 10,000 bits. But time will tell. So you've got... <coughs> You've got different methods. The Viking spacecraft used, used a, uh, um, the original landing on Mars. They used an ablation, then a parachute, then an actual rocket. And then they had, um, they had uh, uh, legs that, that absorbed the last bit of energy. The Pathfinder uh, did the same thing, except it had an explosive and then the absorption of the bags. The Mars Express used the rocket instead of the explosive. And the Beagle went straight from the parachute to, to the bags, and I think not having something in here was its downfall. But maybe the Americans told them about it and the Europeans said, don't you worry about that. <laughs> Any questions? Wasn't the Beagle um, just a secondary thing for them though? Oh yeah. The main part of that mission was their satellite space. Yes, that's right. So they didn't really, if it works, well, that's what they're saying, yes. Yeah. I'm sure if it was the other way around, if they had landed, they would be saying, we got there first, you know.
and the image processing, because this is not raw image, this is image processing was done by Morris uh, Dunn Bertie. And this was with a six inch telescope, but uh, obviously very nicely mounted. And the thing that was looking through the eyepiece recording this was just an ordinary web camera, a webcam that normally sits on top of the people's uh, PCs that they can smile at friends across the world. And uh, as you see, they've got uh, absolutely brilliant uh, image of Mars. It's very, he's got very, very good optics. Uh, I've never seen his instrument uh, actually, but uh, he, was, he was very pleased to be able to test this out because uh, a graze of Mars along uh, the edge of the moon is uh, quite rare indeed. And I believe uh, either later this year or next year there will be a similar one of Venus uh, for us along the edge of uh, the moon. And of course you've got to be in a fairly narrow band before you can actually see it. So you see on this one it, uh, it's now slowly moving away and you can probably make out uh, uh, surface major, the, uh, the dark area. But uh, the, the dark band that uh, is, is going across the centre of, uh, of Mars uh, itself. Unfortunately, there's no sound in that uh, whatsoever. And one final thing I wanted to show you was some of the aurora reports that um, occurred in 2003. Uh, just to let you know what can be seen uh, in this part of uh, the world. Right, so back in May, we had uh, some images uh, from Frankston. The top couple, uh, couple there were taken from uh, Frankston, showing various beams and rays. And actually up in Melbourne, they photographed the, uh, the same one as what they thought was a colourful uh, cloud. And there was uh, one uh, from Somerville, the one reported in New Zealand. This one is from northern Tasmania northern tip of Tasmania on August the 18th. And they had some lovely uh, beams in the evening. And, uh, as you can see some uh, magnificent photos taken there. And this is uh, by a young lad who's only uh, 18 years of age and uh, he does this in, uh, in the evenings. And uh, he's actually very shy to be on the, he doesn't like uh, talking on the telephone so everything's done by email. So unfortunately we can't get him on our uh, raw alert list because uh, he doesn't like uh, talking to people on the telephone. Uh, then on October 24, Western Australia, Perth got uh, some images, uh, in this case with star trails, of uh, an aurora. So that, that's even further north than us, so you're less likely to get it uh, there. October 20, we've got uh, a good showing in, um, in Victoria, and that one was taken uh, there from uh, Frankston, home Frankston there. And uh, another couple there but, uh, later on in the evening. So you can see uh, different uh, beams of colour going up uh, into the sky. From Mornington, Phil Holt, I'm not sure if he's here tonight at all, uh, took this photograph with his um, truck hubcap. Basically, has a silvered hubcap sitting on the, uh, the ground with a camera on the end of a pole looking down on it and took that all sky photograph. South is in that direction. So you see the aurora stretching all the way oops, around there, so it's not moving with uh, this, this pointer. And he took those photographs there with a conventional camera pointing that direction. So that's from near Mornington Racecourse, where he's uh, set up. Uh, that black and white one was taken um, by Rob McNaught up uh, in Coonabarra Brands. So this one was observed very, very far north, but unfortunately only black and white because uh, that, that would be his meteor uh, network camera, I think. So he's not terribly interested in colour. Um, the same one was taken uh, in Wollongong, they got lots and lots of uh, colour there. In um, South Australia, again near Adelaide, beautiful display of uh, the aurora there. Destroyed it, and there. Magnificent beams. This guy is actually a professional photographer. Took those, so he, he uh, likes um, playing around with exotic films. See, um, how best they get it, and this was the panorama he took at the same one. So this is virtually seeing uh, half the horizon at uh, the same time. And he's trying to align the photographs to uh, get the stars and roughly what it would look like to your eye if you were standing there. Or if you didn't bother to align it, um, you, you basically get that. So you see the Southern Cross over here, pointing in that direction, and the two pointers down there. So, uh, that's from Adelaide, which is further north than us. Um, Graphically, magnetically. So the 
there's another one that he took later in the same night. And it's all about getting up at the right time to see them. And there's another one from uh, Adelaide. You just, just happen to be up at the right time. Here in Victoria, we were actually under cloud for that one. So otherwise, we could have got a magnificent showing ourselves. Uh, Gordon Garrett from uh, up at uh, Siding Springs Observatory uh, photographed uh, Mount Aurora on the same day. I'm trying to get uh, obviously very artistic with uh, getting various bits of uh, shrubbery in the way, native shrubbery. Uh, October 31st, uh, New Zealand uh, got to see something, but uh, we didn't. We were actually under cloud at the time, or rain, I think it was. Uh, not always get, uh, get images. November the 20th, uh, Paul from Northern Tasmania again, so the young, young guy, took some more photographs over a period of a few hours. The aurora was up. Again, uh, absolutely magnificent. You see how they move around in the sky and you get uh, various arcs in the sky, as well as these various rays. And they're all perspective, so the thing looks different depending on the angle it's actually pointing at you. And uh, closer to home here, in Baronia, that's what they saw. We uh, didn't see terribly much uh, because of uh, cloud. From Western Australia, uh, Perth Way. Oops. Let's see more. Very nice uh, photographs there. Do you recognise that uh, asterism? See that in Orion? See the uh, sort of Orion there and the belt stars? That's pretty close, December the 5th. There you are, Louise. I even put your, uh, your report in there, and next time you'll, you'll have, to try, you have to try a photograph. <laughs> so uh, that, that was one uh, possibly reported from uh, some of them. That's my first. <laughs> well, your first one. And uh, they're the reports for 2003. And we've got these reports now going back to 1981. We've been collating them uh, for all of Southern Australia. Thank Scorpius is, um, is not quite right. Um, 